Kayla. Hey. hey, so the, the webinar started, we had 12 attendees. I wasn't sure um, if anyone would be in the audience from the commission. So we, we could wait one more minute and see if another member joins us, but we do have a quorum. Okay, um, I just uh, was emailing with um, uh, Madeline. She's gonna, she's gonna be able to join us again until January her maternity you know for her maternity parental leave there so that's good to know we can just let her relax <laughs> and um know know who will be showing up she said she's following some of some of the stuff online right. but 6 30 is not a time that works for family with little babies <laughs> nope go yeah I have something in the oven that is not quite done yet that I have to go check, but I'll be listening. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could do it. I didn't quite make it. And we don't start till 6.35, right? Right, yeah, the meeting starts at 6.30, the continuation's another minute. Did you see my email about the preamble? Uh, I just don't know oh. how to read the part that has to do with the continuation of the hearing. Oh, I, I just think we could just say that it's been continued from um, um, September 14th. Okay, or September 14th, or did, we didn't discuss it. Uh, I, I have no right. memory at this point. Was it from September, September 14th that we decided? Okay, yeah. makes sense. Okay. All right, I'm going to dash off. I'll be back in like All right, well, we have um, 18 attendees and we'll start in a minute, I guess. Again. And I don't know if anybody got to check their email, but I sent out about four, I sent out just a, a Word document of all of Nate's questions in a oh, table right. format in case you guys want to take notes that way or follow along. I thought that might be helpful. Yep. And then, um... It's almost time. So anyone who's here from the library, if you want to raise your hand, we can promote you to panelist. Now you can share a screen and it's easier. All right. I think that's everyone. It's six thirty four on my clock. Right as well. All right. Our panel has grown. 
Yeah, <laughs> this is a big panel. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's six thirty five now. Um, should we open? Yeah, Harry. Okay. Uh, so welcome everyone to the October nineteenth, twenty twenty three meeting of the Historical Commission of the Town of Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law C30A section 18 and pursuant to chapter 20 of the acts of 2021 and extended by chapter 2022 of the acts of 2022 and extended again by the state legislature on July 14th, 2022 and signed into law on July 16th, 2022, this public meeting and public hearing of the Town of Amherst Historical Commission is being conducted via remote participation. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time by technological means. A hyperlink to the hearing has been posted on the town's online calendar. Um, and then, Ben, can you just walk me through how to appropriately announce the continued hearing from our September 14th meeting? Yeah, I just I, I think that was it. Just say it's continued. Okay. And then we'll just do a roll call attendance of the commission. Okay. I think we're ready. Uh, to okay, so roll call attendance of the commission. Uh, Pat Oth. Present. Uh, Antonia Billenberg. Present. <laughs> Really challenging me with last names here. Uh, Hattie Startup? Present. Uh, Michaela Rasnick? Present. And Robin Fordham, uh, Chair of the Committee, present. Is everybody right? I think so. Okay. Um, I just should pull up. So I don't have the agenda in front of me. Do you want to start us off, Nate, while I pull that up? Yeah, so there's nine attendees in addition to the panel, just, just so everyone knows um, who's out there. The, um, you know, I submitted a bunch of questions that uh, have been formatted. Um, we can share that the screen if you need to. There's an updated presentation from the design team. And um, I mean, I think we could just start in with the presentation and then have questions. I think, you know, I was trying to, list everything that may be of interest to the commission and also staff and just that way we can, you know, um, if there's any, any additional things, we can look at them. Um, and I, I don't I mean, I think that's probably it. I don't know if there's a, if anyone wants to start off. I do Nate, uh, I'm, I'm Austin Serrett. I'm chair of the Jones Library Building Committee. I want to thank you again for the opportunity to present to the Historical Commission. I really want to thank you also for the detailed and very helpful questions that you've uh, that you've provided. And um, in the spirit of the season, I'm now going to become a pumpkin and turn this over to FAA so they can lead, lead you through their presentation. Hi, everybody. Ellen Anstalone, uh, principal at Feingold Alexander. <clears throat> Thanks for taking the time to meet with us again. Um, we are we have a slide deck to show you uh, landscape and architectural. And Nate, we have answers to all of your questions. They may uh, it may um, create more questions, but at least we can start by answering them, the ones you've asked. Uh, and we're going to try to keep it brief um, just so we can get have time for discussion and to review the questions. So we're going to start with our slide deck is, is set up to start with landscape, if that's okay with you guys. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna try to keep it to about each each section, landscape and architecture to maybe 40 minutes each, and that'll give us time to chat and ask more questions and that kind of thing. Does that work with folks? Mm -hmm. Okay, Tony, do you wanna kick us off? And, and Dan, can you s share the slide deck? Our a partner in crime, Josephine, is not a, with us tonight, so Dan is going to be helping us uh, with the slide deck and answering some questions if need be. 
but I'll handle most of the questions. So, Dan, can you share your screen or can someone are, allow are you? Are you seeing that? Sorry. Not yet. Well, let's try it again. Here we go. Are you I seeing my screen? Is it, no, is it enabled? Um, Mm -hmm. oh, no. Sorry about this, folks. Is 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 Dan Has he been let, allowed to share? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Ellen. Sorry, I just have to. It, apparently, I have to enable this on my end, which I did not remember. Okay. If you can't get to it, Dan, I can try to share. Do you want to share it, Tony? If that, Let me see if that works. That might be. Uh, yeah. Oh, awesome. I don't know. Can everyone, I'm, am, am I the one sharing? Are you all able to? It was the screen, yes. Thank you. Okay. Yes, thank you so much, Tony. That's okay, Dan. We all have technical problems. No, I absolutely can yeah. um, So yes, as Ellen said, we are going to try to keep very focused to the questions that were asked um, as a continuation. So uh, uh, the first part is going to largely be Rachel's section, but you know, of course, this is what we're talking about with respect to the the site. And I think we're going to just have Rachel go right at the landscape issues. And just Rachel, just tell me next when you're ready to move on to each slide. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Um, this first image is an overview of, of the library and its neighbors. Um, we are on Amity Street and we're next to the Strong House Museum. Um, next slide. This, uh, this image is a collection of images of the library today, what it looks like from the, from the front on Amity Street, um, the existing trees that are in the landscape, the existing stone, and then out back, how the, the grades are actually raised up, blocking views to the library, and, um, block, and then the existing path kind of uh, loops around the back of the library. This side. Um, when looking at the library landscape plan, one of the pla first places we started was looking at old photographs of the original landscape on, around the library. Um, we found some postcards from the 30s through the 50s that showed them. Um, Pretty sparse landscape um, with, with on street parking. Next slide. Uh, this is an illustrative plan of the library today. The areas in the lighter green are lawn, the areas in darker green are planting beds with different perennials and shrubs, and then um, trees are identified on, on site. So there are a number of shade trees on site, a, a lot of ornamental trees. Uh, on the for the project, we are going to be keeping the two Chinese uh, dogwoods that flank the south facade of the building, uh, and we'll be removing uh, two of three of the shade trees in in the back um, of the north side of the property um, due to their footprint being within the footprint of the new addition um, and the regrading required for stormwater. Next slide. Um, also, at the beginning of the project, we are really interested in reusing as many site materials with the new landscape. Um, so Jess in our office, who's here with us tonight, went out and documented um, what types of stone material is present and how we might begin to integrate that with our design. So we've got granite, um, we've got some good slabs of granite, um, also some Goshen stone pavers that, and, and things that we might be able to reuse in our, our design. Next slide. Um, also some Goshen stone walls and steps that we're going to reuse as benches in our in our project. Next slide. And the summary of all the different stones and, and their sizes and square footage, which was helpful for, for figuring out the design. Next slide. This is an illustrative plan, um, same view you saw before, but with the new proposed addition and renovation. Um, you can see that we have uh, cleaned up the, the front landscape quite a bit. We've actually carved out 
two additional spaces out front. There's a children's courtyard area right off the children's reading room. There's a, um, a seating area out front for staff. We've reconfigured the parking lot to make it safer and clarify circulation. We've um, introduced a dumpster enclosure area to really um, simplify and clarify uh, trash collection. And then out back, we have, uh, we're introducing the North landscape, which primarily serves as a place for processing stormwater, but also provides um, a garden space for reflection and an area for reading and studying. So this will be the new North entry with a connection to the parking lot and possibly a future parking garage. Next slide. Um, this is our renderer's view of what that new front landscape will look like. So uh, we have, we've pulled away some of the overgrown planting beds that are around the front kind of blocking view of the library. Uh, we've replaced those with um, a line of Cunningham white rhododendron that max out about four feet, so they won't require trimming. It'll be easier to maintain. We're going to introduce two magnolia trees out front, um, yellow magnolias, and then a row of oak leaf hydrangeas and aronia in, in the, between the parking lot and the library. Um, and another ornamental tree, a sourwood, um, for shade in that staff area. Next slide. And then in that back area um, where the image you saw before showed mounds and a windy path will be much more opened out. We're gonna we're gonna um, lower the grades back here a little bit more and, and provide a rain garden area um, with stepping stones and seating areas um, and, and also a direct access to the library. Um, then we will be maximizing out, maximizing the available site for the library to use. And so we're introducing a site retaining wall right on the property line between the historical society and the library. Um, and that's what's shown here. So it starts about, about two feet high with a railing on top of it. And then it rises up to about four feet high at that, at that corner. Just a quick question, Rachel. In the image right now on the right, are those three trees kind of, um, you know, the foreground and then going back, are those existing or existing or are they any of those new? Okay, the red tree is new. That's the right. South Grass. Um, the tree in the very right corner, that's a new um, uh, swamp white oak. It's a large shade tree. Mm -hmm. um, the tree in the middle is an existing tree that will remain and then the really fuzzy trees closest to the building, those are, um, that's a birch and a Cornell and cherry, which will remain. So those are on the historical society property. Thanks. Okay, next slide. Um, one, of the, one of the objectives of this project is to make it universally accessible. And we're really excited about achieving that. So these series of section elevations through the site landscapes kind of show how we're um, gently sloping walks up to the entries um, without the need for railings or extreme ramps. So now the front entry will have a gently sloped walk that goes up to a plaza, which meets the finish floor of the main entry flush and how we are having gentle slopes down to the parking lot area. So both the front and the back entries are fully accessible now. Next slide. And then these section elevations are taken on both the east and west sides of the library. On um, the west side of the library, we're actually only providing a sidewalk from the emergency exit on the west side near the front of the building, connecting down to Amity Street, and that is also a gently sloped walk. And then on the east side, the area that today is used a lot by pedestrians to make connections from the CVS parking lot to, to, the, to the library and other parts in town, um, will be pedestrian only once it passes the dumpster enclosure area, and that is fully accessible to um, under 5%. Next slide. Um, we'll be improving the lighting on site um, for safety and visibility. Um, we're using more of the um, arm pole fixtures similar to what's out front of the library today, we're using that in the parking lot only. 
And then in in the back of the property, in the north side of the property, we'll, we'll be using pole mounted lights like the one shown here. These are designed to be full cut off and, um, and have um, uniform lighting. Next slide. Um, so sorry, just on the previous slide, the 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 yellow then are the um are the pedestrian lighting in the whatever if that's purple and green. Uh, pink purple yeah the, those are the pole mounted correct and is that and then there's uh, lighting on the building as well right but those that's right. the only site lighting right um next slide some of the materials that we're using on site um are intended to tie into the neighborhood and the, and the character in downtown. Um, so the dumpster enclosure, uh, the image at the top, right, is what we would be using for the dumpster enclosure area, um, more of a wick, was cassette style wood, wood enclosure. The railing next to it is the type of railing that we'd be using at the children's courtyard. I think that was one of your questions, Nate, what would that fence look like? This is what that fence would look like. It would be four feet high. In front of it would be the shrubs, so from the street would, you would not see it, but um, it would keep children within that area. Um, that that um, ornamental fence is also what would be on top of the retaining wall at the back, um, so we'll have a consistent aesthetic through, through both elements. Um, the railings at the front, so there are a couple steps, uh, four steps in the front between Amity Street and the library that are optional. Um, and these would have similar Julius Bloom railings that are similar to what we see at Amherst College. And do you, um, we have to get a variance from the AAB for those, or is that are those? Yeah, we typically do. Um, the AAB requires that the end rail um, return to the return to the ground. Um, the idea there is that they don't want it to like poke anybody. But they have accepted a waiver for this uh, fluted glute. It's called a volute end cap um, because it, it's not a it's not a hard point. Right, um, and then even the profile, right? Is it a slightly different profile than they normally would accept, or is it? It's similar. Yeah, no, it's similar. It's just that the railing doesn't return to the ground or back to the to the post. And then I had a question about the the dumpster fence enclosure. Mm -hmm. is, is the total fence height six feet, or is it six feet to? the perforation and then you know it's an additional two feet so a total of eight feet currently it's six feet to the top of the perforation yep. um however we we do have a retaining wall behind it um which do is think, about two feet do you think the i guess my question is do you think the solid um part of the fence is high enough to cover the dumpster or will it be visible from the street from the street, we'll actually be below the dumpster, so we'll be looking up. Um, but it's something that we could study further and, and get back to you on. There's a big difference, too, with different sizes of dumpsters. Right, right, yeah. I mean, I was just thinking if you're doing it, you know, it'd be a shame to be able to see then <laughs> the top of the dumpster. Uh, you know, for instance, if the fence needs to be just a little bit higher, maybe that would be the solution. But I, I yeah, I don't. Okay. I don't know how others feel, but it's just, you know, if you're putting a fence in and the idea is to screen it, it would just be strange then to be able to see it through the the top. Yeah, we can we can look at that. Um also on this page, uh we are showing the idea behind the the walkway bridge in the rain garden, um, core tin steel with, with railings. They would extend further than what's shown on this image for, for safety. And then in the children's courtyard area, we're going to be uh, stamping in the concrete footprints and feathers of local birds of Amherst. We have 12 birds of Amherst that we've identified that we're going to be putting out there that kids can also color in with sidewalk chalk. Next slide. Um, We'll, we'll be introducing bike racks on the project, four in front and another set of four in the back. And then we have a number of working tables in the back um, of different heights to accommodate children, folks with wheelchairs and people who might wanna stand. We're also introduced, we're gonna reuse a lot of that Goshen stone that we mentioned before into, into benches and to other seating elements in the landscape. 
What's the um, maximum number of bikes that can be uh, locked up at, with the racks that, ex that you're proposing? We can accommodate up to 16 bikes. Okay. So two per, two per rack. Um, next slide. This is a, a study of that, that terrace area on the north side of the library. We're looking at um, how we might bring in paving and seating areas and use the space between the retaining wall and the library for more gathering opportunities. So we're looking at um, a crushed stone with binder, which meets accessibility requirements, uh, just to have a different texture, and then cafe tables and chairs and planting a vine on the wall, either a climbing hydrangea or a, or a clementus. Um, and then, then the next slide. And then one of the questions, Nate, was what is cross-section at that area? So on the left on this slide is a cross-section through the new addition, the library, the retaining wall, and then um, how the seating area slips in between the retaining wall and the library. Um, we do have some catenary lighting to kind of create a more homey atmosphere out there. Um, and then we have an elevation of what that wall would look like with the railing that we showed you before and, and terrace seating um, towards the left of that section. Next slide. Um, as we were thinking about plant selection for the front and the back, um, we, we were trying to keep a refined palette in the front. So lots of um, predominantly an evergreen base with a, a slight hint of yellow and purples and whites. Next slide. And then, then at the back, we were looking at kind of low ground covers that can stand um, dry and wet environments, but also provide seasonal interest in texture and color and be easier for the library to maintain. Next slide. And so this is an enlargement of the landscape in front of, of the plan that we shared before. Um, so you can see in a little bit more detail how the row of rhododendrons kind of create a room off of the children's area on the west. Um, and that existing Chinese dogwood is incorporated into that hedgerow. Um, and then on the right, how we have a seating area underneath the sourwood tree. Next slide. And then out back, um, how we're you know, protecting one of the large existing maples and we're introducing some other large trees that can handle that sort of wet and dry environment of swamp white oak and um, sassafras. Okay, next slide. Thank, thank you, Tony. So I think if we're ready, I can continue on to the building part, um, unless folks wish to pause at this point and have any comments or questions to Rachel, so I can keep going. I guess if commissioners wanna, if there's anything that you really need to know now, you could raise your hand, I don't know. I guess we can keep going. Okay, very good. So this portion deals first with um, changes to the existing 1927-28 uh, historic building. And it starts by first identifying the elevation and the areas that are colored in pink here are the portions that will be removed uh, here shown on the left. And this proposed south elevation therefore indicates what is being added. Uh, and again, the areas that are identified here and here uh, are quite a bit distance uh, behind this front because these are elevational drawings. From the east elevation, this is your existing um, portion as it appears now in this area back here will be removed. And the proposed revised elevation here where this portion is new as part of the expansion of the library and then all the areas in pink occur uh, essentially behind this elevation of the existing library, um, indicating the various masses and elements, including portions on the roof as well, which we'll talk about later. 
on the north elevation, the, again, this portion um, is going to be demolished here, uh, as indicated in pink. And then the revised elevation, and because the new addition, of course, is in front of the existing, therefore everything that one sees in this north elevation is new, as indicated in this coloration. So this is uh, essentially everything that is represented, which we also saw in uh, perspective rendering that Rachel had shown previously. And then from the um, west elevation, again, the area that's identified in pink, this portion is being removed. And then the proposed revised this, uh, design, which is seen here in the west, um, again, everything to the left of this element is all new, uh, which is therefore re rendered in pink in this particular view. Previously, I think we had just talked about the idea within the windows, um, the existing window jam here and proposed and the existing window section and proposed. And uh, essentially the, the primary difference is that the windows, which are the single pane are going to be replaced with the insulated glazing units, which you can see here. Um, but the essential nature of the details and the appearance of the windows themselves in terms of the grid pattern and the like will essentially be um, very similar and trying to match as closely as, as we can to what historically exists. So profile thicknesses, um, the, the notion of subdivided lights, all of that will um, recreate the historic appearance, but with a much more modern energy efficient uh, insulated glazing units, as you can see in this cross section here, as well as in the proposed window jam here. There's a quick question that, on that. So sorry to just keep interrupting, but uh, the true divided light, does that actually get you to the like the U factor and everything that you need in a new window, or is yes. there, it does? Yes, it can, yeah. With the right glass and, and things, Nate, yes. Thanks, yeah, no, I, I looked into it um, from my house and it was actually difficult to get there. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know. Can yeah. you elaborate on what you're asking, Nate? What is a true divided window? Well, like right now, you know, it's like, if you see it, uh, the detail above, you know, there's a, the, um, you know, typically you'd have a wood, a wood frame and the glass is inset into that. So the, you know, the wood grill pattern actually goes through, through the window. You know, it's not like, yep. it's, a, it's not, it's not, it's just an exterior yep. uh, application. And so on the proposed one, they have both, you know, something between the glass and then they also have, you know, interior exterior um, grills. So it's, you know, if you look at it, it you know it looks like as if it's a solid piece through the through the glass. Okay, and we do that, Nate, because many historic uh, commissions request that, so that's why we proposed it. But recently, a couple of years ago, in in Boston on a Charles Bullfinch building, um, the landmarks uh, agreed um, not to have a true divided light because the technology has come so far that you when you're looking at uh, so a, a window that's not a true divided light it's got a piece of wood on each si side of the glass and then a piece in the center so when you're looking at it most people think it's true divided right. and it's it's really not so the technology has come around that that's an option so if that's an option for us not to do a true divided light and you know do one of these uh, applied muntins with a center uh mullion we would love that, but uh, we didn't think. Yeah, you know, most times we, we're not allowed to. But, but if we, yeah. if you guys would consider it, we certainly could. That's considered these. Could they call it a simulated divided yeah. light? So an SL SDL instead of a TDL. So, but Ellen's right. Intents and purposes uh, for most people, they, you're almost it's not distinguishable between one or the other. Um, is there any way for? It's a little bit hard for a lay person to imagine the difference. I mean, I'm sitting in front of a you know, can, can you zoom in, with... Tony? Yeah. I guess, so I guess just... with the with the true divided light, what's between the glass? Is it aluminum or is it um? What's what's that, the actual material? And then with the simulated, it's not, it's 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 aluminum. You wouldn't you we can't do wood in between there because it, it wouldn't last. But if you could zoom into the true divided light, and this, this is what if you have an older home, this is what your your um you, you know the one above it, Tony. This is what you probably have. So it's it's a piece of wood that actually goes from one side of the glass to the other. 
Okay. And it holds so, the whole. Yeah, the so individual you've got, panes of you glass. Like in, yeah. Right. You have panes of glass as opposed individual to. Individual panes of glass. glass. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's yeah. basic. So it's true divided is panes. Yeah. Uh, and, and not true divided would be you have a sheet which mimics the look of the yeah. pane of, of right. the, the, Muntins, but right. uh, oh, okay, thank you. So we would not have the subdividing element here. You can see that this is true divided, which literally also creates a, a separate panes, but a simulated divide light will have one larger pane, but the yep. in, inner detail from the outside Are looks just identical. Applied. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In, in if that was allowed, it is a cost savings yes. item. Yes. Okay. okay. Right. So, right in a simulated divide of light, right, if you can see in this detail, right, the glass would just be. It's one, big, it's one big glazing, and then right. there's interior application of aluminum that sits between the glass right behind the. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So it simulates it looks that it, yeah. it looks divided, but does not have this piece of element that actually splits the panes of glass. Correct. Right. Okay. In, and then, I mean, again, in in my own house, I'm looking. I mean, I have an old window here, and I have new ones here that have you know just the homeowner snap in buttons. You know hmm. that when you are looking at. You know, I was looking at a church up in Sunderland that it's, you know, when you look at the new windows, it's pretty clear that they are not the old windows. <laughs> and I'm imagining right. that these these are much more authentic looking. Than yeah, that this, this, this for yes. sure is the true divided light will be the closest to being looking like this. But of course, with yep. the double glaze, it's be much more energy efficient yep. than what but currently what, exists. Yep. But one thing I wanted to say, Tony, is that what is available to us now in the new technology is that the they're not quite the snap in you know fake applied mullions they look much more authentic and yep. if you if the group would like us to would consider doing that we can get a sample have yeah. it shipped up to you and you can take a peek at it it's really it's it's come a long way you know yeah, I mean, but in this yeah. true divided light this true divided light um they're actually a, a, they're actually affixed to the um glazing whereas in simulated divided light are is it is it going to be glued on or will it actually be snap in if it was it, a would, glued, it would be the, the higher end ones are glued it's yeah. applied that you can't it's, take them it's off applied. yeah 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 i mean I, I don't know how you feel nate but certainly i think looking at samples would be useful yeah no, I, I work with the local yeah i work with the local historic district commission and They've allowed, um, you know, simulated divided light and even just exterior grills, depending on how far it is from the street, right? I mean, their roles yeah. are just visible from the public way. This okay. is different um, in that, um, you know, different project, different how it's, you know, perspective and how it'll be viewed. Um, yeah, I think samples would be great. I mean, I, okay. I, I understand it, um, but I think that for the commission, I think it'd be nice to see. Sure. We'll do, yeah, that would be, that would be great. Okay, thanks a um, okay, I'll keep going. Um, uh, and then coming back to the material um, portion. So what we've represented here, again, this is based on the rendering and the lower right is your existing um, library as it is. So various elements that are being called out. So number one, which is the, this is the new synthetic roof uh, on this portion of the original 1927 buildings. We just talked about the new windows matching the existing with the true divided lights that just went through. Uh, the masonry will be repointed, um, or at least 50% of it. Uh, new gutters and downsprouts uh, will match exactly the existing uh, in profile and materials, and new paint as it's estimated at 10% of the surfaces, um, essentially to make sure that it is um, in looking good. So that is what is identified in the areas which are painted, um, for example, around here. Tony, can I just chime in here and, sure. and we, we confirm this because our team was on site and we've talked to George about it. The existing co copper gutters in downspouts are in very good shape and have been replaced recently. Uh, so we are, the intention is to keep those and th those match the historic profile. So our intention is to keep them. There's one that's damaged that will we'll either repair it or replace a section, but uh, that's good news. Right. Okay, um, and then looking at the other elevation perspective taken from the other corner, again, the same thing, just identifying uh, here the new synthetic slate roof, the new windows that will match the existing, the repointing of 50% of the masonry. Uh, again, the new gutters and downspouts match existing where needed, 
and new paint again on 10% of the painted surfaces uh, where it's identified um, that requires uh, treatment. And again, the lower right is the existing image as exists. And I think the last time I believe a commission member asked, you know, we are not limbing up this tree like this. Um, the tree will look like that, but we just did this in order to make the visibility of what's behind here as shown. But in point of fact, the existing tree is really this, so it will largely obscure uh, the addition, in particular this from this view angle. Okay. Um, I think this is one of the questions that was asked of us, um, which relates to the palladium window. And I'll talk, I can talk yep. to this, Tony. So sure. this is the uh, palladium window in the back. So the back elevation uh, is uh, if just below the diagram. That elevation was changed with the the addition in 1990. The windows were, were shifted, right? So, and you can... You can see if you really look back there, you can see them. They did a terrible job trying to match the brick and the mortar. Um, so this facade has been altered. So what we're doing, that facade, you, you'll be able to see it in our library, inside the library now. As, Tony, if you can point out on the plan. Yep, right here. So th the idea is to keep it in place. The Palladian window stays in place, but we cut down the sill to make a passage from the green section of the library to the white. Essentially, I believe it's to the uh, adult stacks. And that, cause that was one of the questions that came up. So that's, we've done things like this before and it's it's successful. It keeps this, most of the historic fabric intact, um, but it, it's just our approach to that. Okay. And Ellen, you want to talk about this one yes. as well? Yes. So the Whipple window, we know it, it's important. We we are bringing it inside the library rather than try to uh, put it uh, as part of our, our facade. So we're putting it in this on the uh, double height space, and I forget the name of the room. I apologize. So we're our idea is so it'll help preserve it. It won't be outside. And then we're proposing to mount it on this wall. In the exact location, we can we can, if the folks are really if you folks are really interested, we can uh, talk about where to put it in the room. But we think uh, it should be in this room that's high up, so you get the same sense of where it is currently. You know how it's higher up on the wall. So we'll restore the window and bring it inside. Yeah, because it's mounted on the wall. Is it actually going to be serve as a window, or will it be actually no, on the face of it, the wall? Will, it'll be on the face of the wall. Does that does that mean that it will not have light coming through it between two rooms or no? Okay. No. So I think here we're coming back uh, around to just the sense of the edition itself and um, what we've shown here in the relationship of the historic portion of that is being kept, which is in this green color, and the addition in white, which is shown here. And then the red dash outline is the the 1990s portion that is uh, proposed to be removed in, in, and replaced with a new addition. And this is on the ground level plan as shown in this particular instance. And as we move upstairs to the primary um, first floor level, which Again, that this is entered from the historic portion here. Again, the element in green is the portion, historic portion that is being kept, and the area in white and is shown as the addition. And again, the outline then dash red is what is going to be removed. And similarly, as we continue now to the second floor level, again, the historic portion is here, and, and what Ellen was referring to before, the first floor reading room, this is that double high vaulted space upon which the question you raised earlier about that window, that window is placed here. And so it is backing up against um, programmatic elements here. That is why there's not having light coming through. And again, the proposed addition here shown in white and the dash representing the portion that is being removed. And then finally, as we get to the top level three, level four plans, I, the 
the central nature of these rooms is, retains largely intact, but mm -hmm. with the exception that because we're creating accessibility to come up to this third level plan, the elevator does extend up here and it has a small passageway that allows one to get from the elevator and then into this part. Um, of course, this area also is being uh, redone here. This is uh, in order to deal with the accessibility issue, um, but a large portion of this is the historic part um, from the outside is certainly intact. And then there's some internal programming adjustments to accommodate program. And so again, coming back to the um, elevation, so uh, some a little bit more, you know, detail that's just zeroing in on the proposed addition. So uh, I know this is probably hard to see here. So uh, what one sees here, again, in the pink area, this is at the front view, um, is what is being added. And you can see here what's being called out uh, is various things such as uh, brick cladding on the facade, and then there's new synthetics like roof, all the things we identified before with respect to um, the detail elements, the things about the accessible entry that Rachel identified in the re-landscaping at the front. And then as we get to other elements here, what you see here is some portions, including the fact that there's a slope copper roof in, in the sort of elevational standpoint, the repointing of the masonry, standing seam metal roofs, and then a mechanical screens, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute um, behind. As we come to the proposed east elevation, uh, again, uh, what you see here is the proposed addition here, which is essentially brick uh, cladding. Um, and there is mechanical screens identified here. Uh, there is a portion of it, which is shiplap siding, uh, again, which shows up in some of the perspective views. And then the synthetic slate roof um, replacing on the historic. And then here we see uh, this is the extent of the elevator, uh, the new elevator that, that, that emerges above. Um, and then this is the uh, essentially the light monitor that is, again, these are all in the distance. Uh, as a reminder, these are just strictly elevational views. Uh, and then there are going to be some openings um, that are infilled, for example, here with brick to match as identified in certain key areas here on the original portion of the building. And of course, all the landscape has been redone as, as proposed. Uh, coming to the uh, north elevation, again, this is all new uh, on the back side. And again, the cladding is brick. Uh, we have the uh, sort of the shiplap uh, siding here. We have the standing seam metal roof here. Uh, and of course, here. Uh, this is a curtain wall system with the new north entrance uh, shown here. And then in the distance, uh, we have, again, seeing mechanical screens, which are identified here. Uh, part of the elevator penthouse it pops up here, the light monitor, which is here. And then this in the great distance uh, is the historic part that you see of the, the roof that's popping up above all of this. And of course, all of this addition here is lower than this. And as we come to the west elevation, again, everything from this point to the left is all new. Um, we are again seeing brick cladding uh, on, the, on the facade of the addition. We have the standing seam metal roof here. Uh, again, mechanical screens, which are shown and dashed here, here and here, and also the ability to create the opportunity for a PV array, which is shown again, dashed in here on the flat roof portion of the proposed addition. So going at it uh, more from the perspectival standpoint, again, on the material basis, uh, on the uh, rear portion, this shows the proposed new as can seen in this rendering and then the existing as we see now. Uh, and again, what we talked about uh, previously and had shown, including samples that are on, on site, is that the lower part of the proposed addition is a darker color, which is called a cold brick uh, tone here. There is a warmer, lighter color brick, which is called a slate gray. Uh, we have the hardy board uh, uh, siding, which you can see on this element here, which projects forward of the uh, portion of the massing here. And then we have the standing seam roof, um, which is part of the gambrel and expression here and here, as well as the dormers here is part of the same metal clad system. Just a quick question, Tony, on the roof, the flat part of the roof, is that mm -hmm. um, is that a membrane? Or is that what's actually up on the very top? Alan, do you want to answer that? 
sorry, it would be a TPO roof or a e EPDM, and it would be a white or light gray. And there's no parapet or anything, right? So it really is just the... There, yes, there's a slight one, but nothing significant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then in terms of the materials, uh, as we just saw, so this is um, the coloration of the brick. Again, samples are, I believe, at the library itself. So this is the darker, what we call the coal brick. It has some variation in it. Uh, the slight gray brick is the predominant field on the remaining portion of the library, uh, which is above this base. Uh, the hardy board, hardy board siding is uh, on the this projecting element here, which is on the backside, this two-story portion. And then the standing seam roof essentially is covering all the slope roof portions here and here that are visible. And these are just some examples showing the standing seam roof um, in the nature of, you know, the appearance of it. Um, so these are just showing some typical examples. The, the finish would be, you know, a more matte finish, as you can see here, it would not be shiny and reflective. And the, and the dormers here would be also clad in metal. Uh, I, Ellen, did you want to talk to this issue about the slate roof um, itself? Yeah, sure, Tony, about this synth synthetic slate, because we yeah. talked about this last time. So just confirming um, it's manufactured with recycled materials, which we all want for sustainability sake. The warranty is 50 years, which is is not quite the same as uh, real slate, uh, but it is it's a long uh, warranty It winds 110 miles an hour, variety of colors. And the cost per square foot is approximately $30 per square foot. And that's installed in compared to natural slate, that's 45. And that that the, that was a question that came up last time we wanted to be sure we addressed it. So overall the Delta, just if you could stay on the slate, the Delta between the uh, the synthetic slate in the, um, in the natural slate, the delta between the two products is approximately 121,000. So the real slate, the natural slate is 371 and the synthetic is 250, 250,000. So there that's is a well, delta that's there. Like, that's like an 8,000 square foot roof then, right? About? Yeah, I don't have the exact number, Nate. I can get that for you though. And if you if you remember, we're a lot of the back of the roof we're covering over, so it does reduce the amount of slate. And um, just so this... folks know, just, sorry, we're getting okay. our 75% estimate is being done as we speak. So we'll have some updated numbers on that as well. Okay. Um, and is there a, a, two questions? Well, two questions. When you said something, there is a delta there. I don't know what that means. Um, the second yeah. question would be, um, what is, is there? A, I imagine there's a maintenance savings cost over that 50 year, or or I don't know. I, I, I mean, I guess the slate roof is what 100 years, or yeah, you could say it's 100. Uh, this slate roof has passed its prime, and I know there George has paid to maintain it. It, it um, I can't answer you would assume the synthetic slate takes less maintenance, right? Because it can't crack like real slate. Mm -hmm. um, in the delta, I was saying the delta of cost between natural slate and synthetic. Okay. Um, yeah. And is there an example out in the real world relatively nearby where if we were interested in taking a look at it visually just for comparison we purposes? Can find, we can get that for you. Sure. I'm sure there is. We can get that for you. Okay. That'd be great. Yeah, uh, Amherst College has used it, I, I think, uh, in a few instances. Oh, okay. That's nice and close by. Yeah, Robin, I think the the building that that they just did on Spring Street, I think it uses the same thing. Oh, okay. Yeah, if I could get confirmation of that, that'd be great. Okay. Great. Um, I'll keep going. Um, and then again, coming back to uh, using the rendering from the uh, north elevation entry perspective view, again, identify the lower portion here is that uh, darker coal brick brick. Um, the slate color brick is the predominant body here. This is the hardy board, hardy board siding here on the projecting element and the standing seam roof as proposed here. And again, the existing elevation that currently exists now in the lower right. 
And just a quick question. Some places you say shiplap siding. And so is it going to have that style, like a nickel, you know, with a gap or is it, <clears throat> is it um, butted together? What's. No, it's going to simulate uh clapboard siding actually. Not right. shiplap. Sorry, so, Tony. So it'll actually, oh, so it'll actually look like. Um, yeah. Okay. Hmm. Yep. And then Michaela had her hand raised from the commission. I just, I think she lowered it, but I just want to make sure, Michaela, if you still had a question. Yeah, I was like, I can't visualize the square footage of a roof, but then the total cost was outlaid for us. Okay. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, yeah, uh, let me talk, if yeah. I can talk yeah. to this. Yes, please. Um, so this is this is we've talked about this with uh, this group. We've talked about this with Sharon. We've talked about this in the offices. The book drop, right? And the book drop is critical to the function of the library, especially of the library of this scale. Um, so we evaluated where to put it. Um, our first idea was not in the front of this building. We tried to put it in the side uh, where the one of the existing entries is but we could not fit the, the unit that sorts the books in the space behind there. So it's quite lengthy. I wanna say it's 20 feet of, so you, the way the book sorter works, you put your book in, it goes on a conveyor belt and the RFID reads the book. And then it goes down this conveyor belt and it flips it into these different bins. Uh, so then it, so it sorts the books um, and it takes, you know, a number of bins to get this to work. So it's quite lengthy. The only place we can get it to fit is at the front of the library. Um, so what we've done is we've come up with a couple of op options we wanted to run by you guys and get some feedback uh, because we're not married to any of these, and but we would like some, you know, some of your uh, critical thinking on what uh, you think is best. So Tony, or can you zoom into the first option? Sure. For folks. So we've worked with the um, the RFI, the book drop group, and Sharon, I forget the name, TechLogic, and we've got we've worked with them to find the smallest area to uh, that you would return a book in. So this is the size that uh, they're proposing. So. This option is cutting the stone and in inserting the the return in that. Um, it has plus, pluses and minuses. One, it has to cut that stone, uh, but it, it's, I don't know if it's less, that's a matter of opinion, but it does cut the stone. The second option, if you can slide over, Tony, um, is to use a piece of the, uh, existing window. The plus on side of that is we're not cutting the stone. The negative side is it makes the window look a little different. So one option is just to take one section out of the, uh, essentially out of the bottom of the window. So one row of lights, bottom lights out um, and put the book return in that. And the third option um, is takes that whole bottom sash and makes it a, a solid panel with the book return in it. So, Take and if on. you could, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Tony. No, I was gonna say, and I think you're seeing across all of these that the relative placement in terms of its distance off the floor um, is in part controlled by what Ellen mentioned, the automatic book sorter. So in other words, there is some control dimensions as to like, well, you know, how, how far off the floor does it need to be yeah. in order to work? with the equipment uh, once it re retrieves the books. And that's also part of, from the exterior standpoint for universal design. So yeah. someone in, you know that has some disability can easily reach it. Right. So I'm curious to, you know, what folks on, on the committee think, what, what are your uh, thoughts? Um, I'll jump right in. Um, I find the windows much more disruptive to, the reading of the building than the book drop uh, space between the door frame and the windows. And I'll tell you why I feel like I see a lot of historic buildings 
where windows have been broken and the treatment that you get is they don't bother to repair the window. They just infill it with something mm -hmm. and it really throws it. It's to me, it just, it throws off a beautiful window. Um, I think that, you know, if there were an option to, to not disrupt the front facade with the return drop, that would be one thing, but um, I would much prefer it. And, and I'm overall, I'm not as, as uncomfortable with it. It looks a little bit, it looks to me, it looks somewhat natural that you would be approaching the front door and that there would be a book drop too. You're right. So um, those are my comments and I welcome my other commissioners to, to weigh in. Go ahead, Pat. No, oh, you're muted. I have a tendency to agree with you, Robin. I found the window adjustments to be jarring, um, and it and and that you lose the symmetry of the design. And so uh, I don't know whether there's a cost differential, but I'd rather keep the symmetry of the design. And I think the return slot is, although I'd rather not have it in the front of the building, um, is less obtrusive in the stone than it would be in, in changing the, the architectural integrity of the windows. Thanks, Pat. And I just have a question about the drop. Does everything go in there? So like oversized books, movies, whatever people check yes. out. Yeah. yeah. So how big actually is that to scale? So, I mean, is it like, what is that dimension like? We can get to, I want to say it's, 14, 16 inches, but we can we can send that on to you, Nate. Mm -hmm. And what we've done is we've added a piece of trim around it because uh, we're going to have to finish it and make sure it's waterproof and that kind of thing. Um, but we can get you that data. One one other thing I will mention as you folks are deliberating, um, there's also an advantage here too versus this, aside from the comments we we're hearing from you. When people are returning material, you have to think about how they do this, right? So if they open the material, some people can handle it delicately, some people don't. If you're in a window, uh, there mm -hmm. is a slight risk that if someone is not careful and they start to, particularly in this instance here, and you just think about this, if you're opening this return element and you jam something in here, I mean, you know, you're right on top of the window sash, right? So and jam. So there is a potential risk of the window itself. It's certainly not here if you take the whole lower part out. And of course, if you're here, there's no concern about that in terms of any damage to the window itself. Any other comments from commissioners? Yeah, I would agree with um, what both you and Pat said. Um, I think it looks much more in keeping with the buildings, like both symmetry and look of what a window is supposed to usually do in a building um, with the first option. One of the questions was, you know, is there another location in the library? And um, Sharon had said that it really doesn't work. Um, but I guess, so the idea is that this becomes automated. So no one, you're not, so, you know, in some places they, the book drops, someone has to collect it and then go put it somewhere, but you're changing that system around, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and is that for, is that just because of the volume of the books or is there a reason? From our, from, I'm sure Sharon has an opinion, but our, it saves staff time and it's the volume of, of books. I don't know if Sharon, if you had more to say about that. Yeah, for libraries of our size um, and, and the amount of circulation that we do, mm -hmm. uh, switching over to an RFID system from a barcode system is is standard standard operating procedure at this point. Yeah. Um, and it, it, so, yes, the whole point of the books being returned, they, they need to go onto the conveyor belt. And as Ellen explained, the conveyor belt really only fits in this front room. Right. And in order to keep the machine as small and as tight as possible, you want the external drop here, right at the door, for when the libraries close so that patrons can return their stuff. And then you walk in when the libraries open and you can return stuff on the inside. So it's this is the most compact, efficient way of doing it. Uh, Hedy, your comments? Um, I guess I'm just going to say that I think 
there's something still a little dissonant for me about the book drop return slot being in the old director's office. Um, it's 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 a his, it's it's a historical dissonance for me. Um, you know, I'm sure I will adjust. Um, and I think of all the three options. Um, having had the explanations the the one on the far left looks the best um maybe it can be painted gray like the stones um so that it yep doesn't register as as this mechanical piece of what is a non-mechanical facade you know this facade everybody is all about domesticity and <laughs> And we're we're what we're doing is we're introducing something which is all about how, as St Sharon says, the standard operating for a, for a public library today. I did go up to Greenfield, and they are not using it in their new library. They chose not to, um, and it just it just it's dissonant to me. It suggests that you know there's been this big shift, and what had been the library director's office is now the book return system which is mechanical it's it i'm as i said i think i'll get used to it so i'll say I'll, i won't say any more <laughs> any other comments i guess i'll just concur with everybody else i also agree that option one i feel like it visually makes the most intuitive sense for adding this type of functionality to this building and I don't know, it kind of reminds me of like a mailbox sort of situation with the visual element. So I think that maybe it could keep that domestic vibe, just thinking of it in a different way. Interesting. Thanks, Michaela. I agree with you too. I feel like it has that some, some sense, bank drop or a mailbox or. All right. Thank you. Okay, I think. Uh, Thank you. Thanks for your stuff. feedback. Yeah, appreciate that very much. Very thoughtful comments. Okay, I'll just keep going. Um, and I guess Alan, you want to talk to this one too? Yeah. Well, so this again, one of Nate's questions also a good one. So as uh, um, Rachel mentioned a few times that this oh I uh, maybe this is not the one that we're going to talk about, but. I'm going to talk about it here, um, and then Rachel, you can talk about the the bollard. Um, so, what we need to create here is a library with for universal design. So, right now, when you go up to the front door, you have to go up a couple of stairs. And as you can see on the, the yeah, Tony, just on the right. Um, so, what we're proposing, and Tony, can you forward one more slide and see if we have a better. I think this so is I guess really, that's it. All right, yeah, perfect. Is, yeah. And, and actually, the side, the slide uh, before this, we can look at too. But this, so the idea is that Nate, you, you're right on. So our new, we have to bring our walkway in our plaza because we need to get to the book drop, up to the to just shy of the sill of the existing building. So we'll be about a half inch at, at maximum from the top of the uh, door sill. Will be our new. Um, pad patio or plaza um this will allow us to have a universal design what it does cause us to um have the need to take off the bottom plinth of the column right and all, that material tony's uh pointing to we'll have to take that take that off so we can install the the new patio which gives us the universal design so it's just it's it does it's going to alter the the bottom of this on both sides of the entry. So are you also going to remove the the threshold and then put something different down? I mean, otherwise the, you're going to have something, right? The actual threshold now would be lower than the concrete. Is that? No, 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 no. Yeah. We're that we our intent, Nate, is to keep the existing uh, uh, threshold. That's the idea. And the, the it so that line where the threshold is just that elevation just comes across from the bottom of the threshold there. So yeah. yes, 
And so how is that the, universal design? Um, it's not the bottom of the threshold. It's the top of the threshold here. down within a half of an inch. Yeah. So to your question, Nate, it's cutting right where you see my mouse cursor here. Yeah. Right this is the part we have to move. Yeah, in order to create universal access, we cannot have a bump or a threshold blocking people from entering. So we, we, we do have to create it right here in order to create universal accessibility into the library. So is that wooden piece though now is going to be essentially below the not yes most of it will be and we'll have yeah. to deal with that yes yeah was there like concern with rot yes. or anything water we'll we'll have to we'll we'll have to investigate what we do but that existing sill is staying it's integral to this frame in the other piece that another question you had Nada is about the door operator. And this is what we've done in the past. Rachel's group uh, brought this one to our attention. This is quite nice. It's a it's a bollard mounted push plate. And Rachel, do you want to point out where it would be in the vicinity of the of the front door? Tony, it's, it's probably to the left of the um, entry door. Although no, the plan showed it on the right. right. So I guess yeah. that was one question. Right, I think it's on the right. Yeah, I on yes. We'll yep. have to analyze which side it's best to be on. Um, With the door swing, you're going to still have it on the right? It, probably on the left, but it, it's either going on the left or right, and we'll right. figure that out. But this is what this is the idea of what it will look like. Right. So but, we're, not, we're Sorry, Rachel, just it won't be mounted on the building. I think that's the important thing. Right. Thanks, Ellen. And and also for, for functionality, too, um, we've heard that it's easier to to use if it's not attached to the building. So if someone say we're in a wheelchair and they go up to the building to push it and they have to get away out, away from the building to get through the door. So having it between between the walk and the door uh, with ample room to maneuver is important, whether it's on the right or the left. But it would be it's pretty visible though. Then right, I mean that's higher than any of the shrubs or the wall. It's it's about forty two inches high typically. And the wall is about 30 inches high. So it'd be about 12 inches above the wall. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Is that is there just one main door now or is there a vestibule again? So is that operator just for the one door or is it? It's for the one door. Yeah. And the, the idea is the interior door will re just remain open. Um, in terms of the, I don't know if that's technically considered, a, if those are pilasters or engaged columns yeah. that the, mm -hmm. um, to my mind, that change is a little jar is actually more jarring than the book drop. But um, and I, I'm not sure quite how one. It, I mean, I certainly understand the importance of universal design, but it's really going to shift the balance of those architectural pieces in a way that might, you know, as you're approaching them, they might look wrong. And you know, to from from a kind of instinctive design perspective, like where did where did the foot go? <laughs> um, it's, a, it's an interesting conundrum. It it is an interest. It is interesting because if you if you say if you think okay, we'll take the bottom plinth off and just slide it up, it throws the proportions off. Right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, and if you if you cover it, it it disappears underground. <laughs> yes. But if you were ever to take the for some reason you take the patio away you could recreate what was there. Right, right. And that is a, a, a reversibility is an yeah. important factor. That's right, true. Right. Hmm. Interesting. And then anyone is concern a about water it? filtration under the door? I mean, at one point there was in the there's there was in earlier plans there was the idea of having some, you know, kind of like plexiglass trellis system, but that's not the case that's now. That's gone. Right? No, no. Is there a way to get a better visual rendering of what that would actually look like once it's yeah. completed? We, we could do some kind of sketch for you. 
that would be helpful. I, mean, I, I actually think that image right there, if you remove some of the, um, you know, the boxes and everything, I think it would actually be, and that's kind of, that shows it. I just oh, think okay. We have to just, for our own construction documents, we have to do details of this and we're happy to share those with you. Okay, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, I think between, and again, very appreciative of all the comments. Yeah. I think between the, the you know, of course, the real significance of universal accessibility for all patrons to come at the library, this design with the new patio here that Rachel had been describing with also all the new planting, I, I think it's going to be a, it's going to be different, but I think it's going to be, it's going to be quite beautiful because I think the whole sense of the rival sequence of the library is going to feel much more, in some ways, welcoming. Um, it's going to not create barriers for folks of all right. persuasions to come to your library. I think that alone sends a very, very powerful message. I do think we can handle this successfully and sensitively. Mm -hmm. And as Ellen said, try to do it very carefully. And to your point, Nate, about the detailing, all of that is really significant. We're gonna have to get into more of this um, as we develop the details, but uh, we're very aware of the sensitivity of anything that's added to the historic front. But I think we can balance the, the need for that kind of, um, relationship of the design elements and the details uh, mm -hmm. against the uh, desire to create a very accessible library for everybody. Sure. So just <clears throat> totally not about this, but you know, that plaque on the left side of the door right now, Here. if you're putting the book drop to the right side, would there be oh. a way to replace the plaque so it's the same dimensions? Uh, and then, you know, there's some symmetry there as opposed to having um, two different size, um, you know, essentially boxes right next to the door. So I think if, you know, I don't, I don't know if what commissioners think about that, but it's just, I think that would, you know, if you can make the book drop as small as possible and then make the, the, um, the plaque yeah. at least be proportional, you know, so it has the same, you know, proportions and height and width or length and height or however you want to say it, um, it might help with the symmetry. Well, it's interesting, Nate, that you point out a great observation. I actually, I, to my eye, I actually think the kind of more bronze color of the plaque actually disappears more even into the wall. And maybe because they're just so used to seeing it, but you know, the fact that there's so much variation on the stone, right? With the colorations from grays and darks to browns, I think having something which sometimes when things go a little darker, they disappear more than something that's bright. So I think when we look at the book drop and certainly the comments are very well taken about the color of that and the sensitivity about how it looks against um, the stone, I think we're, we're, we certainly can look carefully at what material feels like and how it balances against, mm -hmm. as you said, Nate, the plaque itself. Yeah, no, that's a good comment, Nate. Do we have one more slide, Tony? I think the I next, be... yep. okay. I think this goes right to the roof element. So we have a couple, we have several more uh, elements to go through. So should I just keep going? Yes, yeah, so this is showing you the roof screen again. One of the questions from la from last time. Um, so what we're showing in yellow is, are the outline of the roof screen. So we try to keep it, it's higher than the equipment, right? So that's the mission to your comment earlier, um, Nate, about the, the trash uh, bins in the fencing. This, the idea is this, you're not gonna see it. You're gonna see, and Tony indicated that on our elevations. Um, that you're gonna, this is, you're going not going to see the equipment. You're gonna see the screen. Right, and we have some perspectives coming that just shows some yes. different viewpoints of all of this. Yeah. So as we go with this, for example, um, uh, this is more in-house um, 3D modeling. So here, you can see where the elements that, um, as Ellen described here, is where they, uh, you know, pop up in various views, um, but it is pretty discreet and uh, in terms of what this looks like. So what what is that material though? So we, there's been instances where someone will have it be like a louvered. Yeah, it's a screen, yeah. We have something you can actually see we, right we up. Have, into we it. have something to show you, Nate. That's coming. Yes. Yeah. So I will yeah, show you that. Question. And so, yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah. So I'll just keep going through the view so you can see the various impact. And again, from this angle here, looking at the other corner, um, this is the mechanical screen that Ellen pointed out in terms of this portion. Um, and then from the straight on, you know, side elevation again. It essentially almost really disappears. And, and particularly depending on how close you are to the building, it's it's really almost not visible at all. And again, taken from this, uh, the proposed new addition in the back, uh, you can see it showing up here. And again, depending on how close you are to the building, it, it's varying degrees yeah. of visibility or not. 
And I just want to just say why we did this in this white model, because we can't actually do uh, professional renderings of each of these elevations. It's no. just not in the budget, but we were able with our Revit uh, model, we were able to do these, it's called like a clay model. Uh, so that's why we're showing it in this this way. Oh, no, I mean, yeah, I'll, I, mean I, I think I asked for it, I think that's fine. I mean, um, we've done that before in other projects and it's a lot more, it's a lot easier to do this, right? I don't, I mean, I don't know, I, I won't speak for the commission, but for me, it's, I think this is a lot, really helpful as opposed to an elevation too. So yeah, I don't okay. mind seeing it as a, you know, in a grayscale or I don't, it doesn't have to be rendered all the time. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Nick. And then as far as the material question, Nate, that you asked, this is what is being uh, looked at. Um, I don't know, Ellen, do you want to say anything about this material? No, this is material that we've used before. And again, when you're on, this is, um, uh, and again, we can Get you, we can get you a sample. We have a sample in the office. When you're down on at an angle, you don't see through it. But but I think we should probably send you a sample just so you are, um, are we're on the same page. Because Nate, I'm with you. I've seen um, roof screens that actually don't do anything because you can see through them. Yeah. But we need to add. We need to allow air through. Air. And it's and it's metal, of course. In yes. terms of material. Yeah, for maintenance, yeah. Maintenance, yeah. And then I think we just have a few more to, to go through. So um, as we come back to this, of course, this is just a reminder of where we are in terms of the design. I think this constitutes the last image in the presentation to, today or tonight. Yeah, and, and if I could, I and then we can take questions. I just want to be sure we get to Nate's questions. I want, and then I'm sure I'm going to, get some more questions from this, but um, I think we answered a couple as we went th through it. Uh, the interior, could interior storms be used to allow the current windows to remain? Interior storms are occasionally used. We don't recommend it for energy use, right? One of the, as we're getting more into, everybody's getting more into sustainability. The biggest heat loss is through, through gaps in the facade and these, these old windows in the, I don't know, Tony, can you go back to that window detail? Um, yeah, you showed it right. You're going to insulate inside the- Yeah, yeah. we insulate we insulate the the, the um, weight pocket. It's much more efficient. And that's why we don't recommend them. And it's over time, it's a maintenance issue for the building owner because people try to take them out and try to open the window. So that's why we don't recommend it and, and that we would not propose it for this building. And um, Nate, you mentioned see the preservation briefs about material substitutions. Did you have any specifics on that? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I think, um, you know, Hedy had um, sent it along. I mean, I think it was, it's, it's, it's relevant to, you know, the roof, uh, the synthetic slate. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I mean, I think that's Sorry. probably really about it. Um, okay. And we, yes, we, we, we do have that. Um, and then the cost of the slate roof installed, or is it just material? The cost that you, you see are, is our estimator does install it's, it's for the materials and install installation. So it's both. Uh, we so, talked about, Oh, sorry. So with the slate roof though. I mean, so you said it was, um, it's past its life. And so, yes. So you you could there's no way to like patch and repair or anything. It really no. would be. Uh... And I think George is on. I think he's been patching and trying to repair this thing for a long time, and it's just it becomes a maintenance headache. And it what we try to do when we leave a library is leave the maintenance much less than it currently is. Mm -hmm. um, and that's it's beyond that. We we would love to keep it, Nate, but it's beyond its useful life. We Can talked. I, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just one staying on the the slate roof there. Um, mm -hmm. So I used to own a house that is sort of um, Katy Corner from this one on the corner of um, Halleck and Earth Prospect, and we had a slate roof there. It's gone now. Um, and um, you know, every I, I as a homeowner, everyone. I would talk to would say, oh my God, you know, it's late roof maintenance, maintenance. I had a guy come every year, you know, to replace some slates <laughs> and, and it just kept going. Um, so, 
I, I, but I also understand, you know, the higher cost of slate. I guess my question is if you've got a 50 year synthetic roof um, and if, and I don't know this, but um, if, if, you know, conjecturing that, you know, a slate roof, a new slate roof was a hundred years with, you know, that, that lower, you know, lower, it's lower cost maintenance over time. You know, I put a new roof on the house that I live in now, you know, cost, I can't remember what it cost me, but I won't have to touch it until it's dead, right? That's the big difference. So you pay everything all up front. And then once you have to replace it, you know, you have to be figuring that in. So I guess I'm curious if, you know, if you were to compare apples to apples, would a new slate roof, um, you know, be over a longer lifetime and therefore, you know, the cost, the cost differential would be a little bit, um, you'd have to kind of move things around to kind of get them to equal out for that same lifetime. Does that make well, sense? I think, yeah, I, I know what you're, I know what you're saying. The, so the warranty for the synthetic slate is 50 years. That's not saying it has to be replaced in 50 years, right? That's, that's the warranty. It's hard to predict how, how much slate will need to be repaired. It depends if a, if a branch hit it or somebody walks on it or someone throws at it and it cracks and it, right. it could be anything. Right, I mean, right. slate, the synthetic slate is a synthetic product. It's not a stone. It's less likely to crack. Um, so I don't, I don't think we could really evaluate that over. I don't think we could do that for you is to figure out which would, which would um, cost more over time because it's hard to figure what, how much maintenance it'll need. What yeah. we can yeah. do, which we did is share the initial cost. Okay, yep. I mean, it, it, I, I just think that, um, I mean, definitely Slate has a certain, you know, it has a certain uh, look that I guess, you know, I, I haven't looked at a lot of buildings with, um, with uh, imitation Slate, but, um, you miss something, <laughs> and that's that's my question. Yeah, I mean, and you know, it, and I I understand the cost issues around it. So, excuse me. Okay. Um, we talked about the book drop. Uh, what is the material of the elevator shaft and other roof protrusions, roof monitor? So the elevator shaft. Can you point to that, Tony? Um. Yeah. It's... It would be. Um, I think we got it in one of these views. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in those mock-up views that we were looking at three-dimensionally. Like, for example, I believe it's here. Yes. So that would be what that would be the clapboard, the the hardy, you know, clapboard style um, cladding. The monitor will be. You won't really see the monitor. Yeah, you don't really. See um, it. You don't see it, and that will yeah. if if it. it what you'll mo what we have to do so it's glass and then it's a lot of flashing to keep it watertight the two ends where we don't have glass will have most likely um the same clapboard siding mm -hmm. but you know, most on your plan on your plan sorry um in a few places you say shiplap siding and i feel like the example you showed was shiplap and it wasn't you know I, right. I think i think i think we're still reviewing this i i think right. our attention originally was shiplap siding because we were looking for a more um, clean aesthetic versus clapboard siding, and the size of the clap and the size of the siding itself is of a larger dimension than a conventional house siding. So, um, the moment we were looking more in that kind of flat yeah. element, it's not it's not clapboard siding where it's overlapping. Um, well, that's what. So this is what what's happened. So they the, this company has discontinued the line. That's the shiplap. So where with Tony's point is that we're still trying to sort it out, which out. which yeah. we could do because you know yeah. public bid we need three equals. So right. that so, that's the challenge. So the preferred is shiplap. Yeah, I mean right. I, I'd actually rather not see clapboard siding because that, to me it becomes, okay. you know, it's like you're trying to mimic an older style with a newer material, I'd rather see it yeah. be butt joint or yeah. hip lap or nickel gap so that yeah. it's clearly modern and not trying to replicate something with like a six inch reveal or something yeah. that really isn't mm -hmm. what would have been there. So honestly, like- We, um, we agree with that, Nate, absolutely. Bolt, That's well, our would place, um, you know, a newer building and they did vinyl siding. And at one point they were gonna do concrete. And honestly, I wish they had just stuck with concrete and done something more modern looking mm -hmm. than, but you know, you know, vinyl yeah. siding on something that was, yeah, yeah. Um, just for the rest of us, um, um, 
the difference between I know what Clabbert is. I'm not quite sure what um, Chipboard is, but just a quick description for our other commissioners. Or what was it? Ship Shiplap Shiplap. Yeah, I, th yeah. I think the. Is it in that? Is it in the slide deck, Tony? I don't yeah, know. Google it gives that <laughs> level of detail. Um, I think in order to understand, um, actually, I was trying to look it up on Google to give you an idea. Is an example what it, it profiles at. Yeah. So essentially, there's no protruding overlap. Right. Let's see if I can find something to share. And you'll have to, if I do share this, you have to ignore the color of it. That's not <laughs> what we're proposing, but I will give you a better sense of the materiality of it. Let me just see if I can find a good image for you guys here. There you go. Well, they interlock, Tony, that section that shows yeah, the. This one. Keep going down. Yeah. Can they actually, see? no, on the other side. Oh, here, this one. No, on the larger, on the larger set of images to the left. Yeah, the other, the other frame to the left. There yes. we go. This and one. then scroll down. This so we one. Can, no, keep going down, yep. down, yep. down, 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 down. Right there, it shows you the section of the siding. So yeah, it's it's almost like a tongue and groove. They just <laughs> butt together, and there's no overlap. Right. And, and to Ellen's point, when you look at the detail, you see this, um, it looks, it's essentially um, quite flat and there there are revealed joints. It, it, and that's why they call shiplap because they're literally overlapping each other as stock elements. And it creates a very, very clean and, and in a more contemporary look. So it is not clapboard siding, which overlaps each individual piece. And the dimension of this does tend to be of a larger scale, which we are also believe is more appropriate given this is an institutional library, not a residence. Thank you. Okay, I'll stop the Google search. Okay, thank you for that, Tony. That okay. was helpful. I was trying to get something to you to look at. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. good. Okay. No, I think that, yeah, that, yeah. I was going to um, annotate it even, right? But um, right, I mean, shiplap. You're going to see it's going to look something like this, right? With that little yeah. joint that Tony showed. Yes. Whereas your conventional clapboard siding, you know, you have it's like I don't want to say like a Christmas tree, right? But you have that reveal. Yeah. With yeah. Overlap. They and overlap. Then, you know, a butt yeah. a butt joint is just going to be, you know, something straight down. Yep. And there's no there's no gap. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. These are good. Nate, can we keep these details on this? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of neat with Zoom. You can do that. Yes. Thank you very much. That was a very clear explanation. Yep. So to continue with the with Nate's questions, what is the siding material under the area with the TPO roofing? Is this shiplap? And that is on that that's a that was um, an issue with our Revit model. It's not it's not shiplap at that point. So what? Yeah. So that's an I um if I shared my screen, you know, one of my questions for everyone was um I can stop sharing. You know, in one uh, if this is visible just right here, there's um you can see a little bit of a roof here and so the question is what is this material right so we have been we've been since we finished this presentation we've been investigating it we're, we're showing it as tpo but there looks like there's lines in it so right now where we as of yesterday we're thinking of copper so that slope is too low for slate um and we don't want to see a a a membrane roof at that location. So we feel that we'll, we will most likely end up with a flat seam copper roof uh, right there. So as most of you know, I'm sure, copper goes in as this shiny copper color and then within months it becomes brown. And it's not till years and years and years that it becomes green. Um, but that's what we're, we would propose here. It's just, we didn't think the rubber the you know the that kind of roof is appropriate for the for this location. Um, the new the new exit door near mimic the curve. So this is yes, this is the one. Thanks, Tony. So this area right here. So the the slope because we looked at this. So if you look at the slope on the right hand side of the scambrel roof. It's a it there's a bend to it, right? So on the left hand side, this is an existing condition. There's no bend till you get much farther 
further out. So to make to mimic this roof, we would have to take down some of this masonry and rebuild it and cut it back to, to match that, if, if you can understand what I'm saying. So if you see the break in the roof when it extends, Tony, can you, where the front I facade not, is? Yeah, I'm not controlling this one. This is, I think, oh, um, Nate. Okay. Nate is presenting this. Yep. Right but, there, but I, Nate. I know what you're saying, like, it, you know, this, this level right here is a diff different, Right? That's it's a saying. different point. It's a yeah. different, essentially, spring point. And that's why we couldn't, we honestly tried like heck to get it to work, and we couldn't. So the I, the one on the left never matched the one on the right. right. So our thoughts are just using the same style, but not we're not able to to copy it. Mm -hmm. But we, we, we were on thinking the same thing as you were. And then the question is, what style of the new exit door? And, and we assume, Nate, you were talking about the doors in the addition? Right, so right here, there's an exit door. There's a new one, um, you know, on the different uh, east and west. Yes. And, you know, would they somehow match what's on the, the no. 20 building or would they just be completely different and match each other? Um, completely different and match each other. So you, as everything new will be new. Everything in the addition will look different. And that we find is just strengthens the historic character of um, the existing building. Yeah. And I think that I I think we covered all your questions, and you know we're happy to. It, thank you for giving them giving them to us um, ahead of time. That that way we can prepare properly uh, to answer them. No, I, I think you did as well. So I don't I don't unless the commissioners have any anything else. You know I, I went through the plan, staff looked at it, and we I developed that list just so we could you know try to address things that may be asked tonight. Um, I just have two quick questions um, or one is a comment really just about the Whipple window um, and the fact that it won't uh, have light through it anymore. I was curious what other commissioners thought about that and whether there was any possibility to reuse it in a way that it wouldn't be a dead window, I guess. Um, and then um, this is kind of a larger question and uh, it could be answered at a later time, but um, I've, I don't recall which tax credits, if any, the pro, the um, project has intending to or has applied for. And um, I'd be curious to know that and um, uh, have a discussion about what the review of the scope of work through those applications would look like, just so that we could have that information. So the the lever has hired a consultant, Epsilon, to, to apply for um, state and federal tax credits, Sharon? No, just state. We decided state. not to go for federal. Just state. Uh, and that application is in. They had uh, um, a few questions for us and we responded. So we're waiting to hear back from them, I think in December, Sharon. I agree, yes. We're hopeful. Okay, thanks. So on the Whipple window, um, is there anywhere else There's in uh, the addition where the window could be that would let in natural light? In the not in the addition. Not um, in the addition. Okay. No, what, I, we don't think it's appropriate on the addition just because it's so historic. Mm -hmm. um, one thing we could look at is maybe illuminate. We could we can figure out anything, but we could um, we could almost do it like a lay light. You know how a, a false lay light is um, just lit from above. So we could maybe figure on maybe we can light it from behind some way. I mm -hmm. mean, would that be something that you folks would be interested in? That would probably be an easy thing to do. And would be happy to do it. Wouldn't be cost prohibitive, prohibitive or anything. Pat, did you have a comment? I, I you see, to unmute. Um, I, I was thinking uh, about whether or not it could be backlit, and yeah. you just answered my question because I think you know architecturally, it's an interesting window. Historically, it's an interesting window, mm -hmm. but it's a window. And so for it not to have natural light, as Hetty was suggesting, if it could be backlit, we would be able to benefit more from the architectural aspect of mm -hmm. it. 
And um, there may be some way to highlight the historical nature of it as well. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah, that's certainly something we could, we'd have to run it by our committee. But yes, that's something that we can easily accommodate. Thank you. Um, sorry, just as you guys were talking um, and just thinking aloud here, um, and places is just me thinking aloud. So the window location, you can see this is the area that Ellen has been talking about, right? This double height vaulted space, which the mm -hmm. window at the moment we're showing on this wall. However, maybe if it's placed on this wall, and again, I'm I'm just talking aloud. I'm not suggesting we can do this yeah. yet, but you can see here, given the ESL program here, if there were a possibility of actually thinking about, you know, suggesting something that actually could even open the window to this ESL room from within here to here, we can take a look at that. And I think Ellen Sully's suggestion well, makes well, absolute sense because I it's think a we did. practical way. Um, and maybe it doesn't work in section to do that. Right, Tony, and we didn't catch you up. We, we looked at this yesterday okay, again, um, the, and we, we, yeah. we've been working with uh, Sharon in the uh, uh, where we're going to locate uh, artwork in the building, existing right. artwork, and right now there's a there's a the painting mural. slash mural on yeah. that wall because that's right. exactly where we went initially. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it seems it seems like that mural works well there, but Sharon, I don't know if we could consider moving that. We we can look at that, but at a minimum, I I believe we can um, backlit it and at least yeah. illuminate it. Okay, I didn't mean to derail the conversation, but it just, as you guys are thinking about it too. We're, we're, yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> um, do commissioners have any other questions or comments? Could the back lighting change colors with the seasons or something at least? Yeah, be, yeah we could, we, music, uh, we could like certainly do that. Yeah. LED, yes, orange you for don't Halloween. Do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, My only comment, Robin, is just to thank everybody for the careful attention to detail in our questions and um, att attention to the integrity of the new addition to the historic building um, and for presenting it so well to us over two meetings. Yep. Agreed. Robin, before you um, close with us again, I want to thank the Historic Commission for the care uh, and sensitivity that you've displayed in reviewing our uh, plans. And I also want to say something that uh, I think it's important to say. When we chose Feingold Alexander, we chose them in large part because they had a demonstrated record of doing what we wanted them to do. And a big part of that was historic preservation. And what we found in working with Fine Gold Alexander, I think you've seen demonstrated tonight, which is responsiveness and creativity. So we think from the point of view of the project, but also from the point of view of everybody's interest in historic preservation, that we have, um, if not a world-class team, I would say a Boston-class team. Yeah. And we're really <laughs> grateful for their work. Thanks, Austin. Thank you, yeah, thanks, Austin. Thank I mean, you. Robin, I, I'd like to have a motion from the commission saying that they find that, you know, this is consistent with the restriction and the standards just so that, um, you know, it's not left to question really what kind of what the result was of this. Okay. Um, do we need to, uh, get, do we have to have a public comment at this point, Nate, or? Yeah, I mean, it is a public hearing. So I guess we, you know, we have to have, we can allow for public comment. Okay. There was some um, earlier, you know, in the previous meeting, there hasn't, you know, there was one, um, everything's been posted. There hasn't been anything too recent. Okay. Um, if anybody in the public would like to make a comment at this point, um, raise your hand. I see seven attendees right now. Uh, I want to recognize Jane Wald. Can you... Uh, I think you can just unmute yourself, Jane. Okay. Thank you for recognizing me. Uh, I've I've followed this project pretty um, 
with great interest from its inception. Um, Jane, can I just, I'm sorry, I know you, but can you identify yourself for the yes, sake I, of your I mean, Yes, yes. Um, uh, I'm Jane Wald. I am executive director of the Emily Dickinson Museum, uh, a former member of town meeting and a, uh, a former member of the historical commission. Uh, I am also, uh, as as an employee of Emily of the Emily Dickinson Museum, I am an employee of Amherst College. So I want to say, I want to offer a disclaimer that I am not speaking on behalf of any of these organizations. Yet I am uh, calling on my own, uh, you know, twenty five years plus. Uh, in working in historic preservation, um, and I may uh, I may refer to some experience of the Emily Dickinson Museum, but but in general, I'm offering my comments as a 37 year resident of Amherst. Um, so I have a number of comments, and I'll try to go through them pretty quickly. Um, first of all. Um, the project with the Jones Library, in my mind, as a long-term preservationist, is a little bit more like a rehabilitation than a restoration. And I think that's an important distinction to, to bear in mind, that we want to make this building functional for our current and future uh, users. Um, my first set of notes uh, discusses the simulated uh, divided light versus uh, true divided light. And, you know, I, you know, historic preservation is now running headlong into sustainability. That's an important nexus. Um, and I know that the, um, that there's a difference between the cost and the energy efficiency and the risk of failure of one-to-one -one, um, replacement of, of uh, in kind of, of historic windows. So I think the distance of the, of the from the street view, um, it, it makes a difference in the choices that uh, the historical, that the library and the historical commission may consider. Um, the description of the selected lights, uh, the appearance seems good. Um, and I presume that that those um, interior, exterior, and um, between glass um, uh, components don't, uh, don't apply to the new addition but I think they would be acceptable for the 1928 building. Um, next is uh, a little bit of experience with a slate roof. Um, I'm intrigued by the new synthetic roof, the new synthetic slate roof proposal, because I know that um, historic slate roofs are extremely heavy and extremely difficult for um, structural integrity of a building. So I'm all for uh, a synthetic slate roof. Um, the Palladian window, the discussion of the Palladian window, the, the architectural and functional treatment looks really good and makes sense to me. The Whipple window um, as an ornament, but not a functional window, that is, um, trans transmitting light, um, that's a little bit disappointing. And I would really endorse finding ways to make it functional or at least backlit so it looks like it has a function. Um, I think I, I wrote a bunch of notes about the uh, appearance of the rooftop construction, the light monitor um, that tracks from... Uh, at least on the elevations, tracking from the 1928 building on the east elevation, but I'm uh, satisfied from the pedestrian view that it's not visible. I, I, I think that's a really, really important thing to um, consider. The copper roofs and the, and the copper gutters are just great. That's terrific. 
Um, for the book drop, yeah, I agree with everything that uh, commissioners have said and vote for option one as the least intrusive on the facade of the building. Um, universal design, um, I think I heard that there was a one in, a, a half inch difference between the patio level um, and the threshold, and I assume that meets universal design. Um, in general, I think it is well worth it to create a completely accessible and equitable entry. So um, the notion that um, there might be lost the footing of the pilasters it is not as um, concerning to me, especially if that um, that historic design element can be represented in some way. Um, the bollard mounted push plate, um, you know, it could be mounted on a rougher, uh, a rougher uh, surface uh, that is in aesthetic alignment with the stone front of the library itself. Uh, but I, I don't think that's necessary. It's just, you know, maybe just integrating um, the bollard with the stone front of the library. Um, and then, you know, the uh, my final thing, the shiplap siding. You know, in Amherst, in the mid-19th century, the shiplap siding was actually considered flushboard siding in Italianate um, architecture. And, um, you know, I that could uh, speak to uh, some of the historic houses down Main Street that do have Italianate flushboard siding. So that seems like a really great idea. Thank you for hearing my comments. Thank you, Jane. Um, I see that Marty Smith has their hand raised. Can you let them in and unmute? There we go. Yes, thank you. I'm Marty Smith. And I have been an architect for about 50 years. I've worked at the university for over 40. And I have been a town resident for almost 50 years at this point. So just to give you a little bit of, I'm also on the um, disability access committee for the town. So I would like to commend the design team for making this building truly accessible from both the north and the south end. I mean, no one knows what's going to happen on the north end, but assuming it will at some point be parking, residential, who knows, but Having access to the front door is incredibly important. And I think your the book drop solution number one is absolutely the only acceptable solution because it looks purposeful. Being in a window, it's not purposeful. It's just seems like something you did to solve a problem. So yes, you've done a great job with that. Um, if you wanna look at a synthetic slate roof, there's one at the visitor's center at UMass, which was built at least 30 years ago. It's probably not the slate uh, composition roof you're looking at today, but it will tell you how really sturdy these roofs are. I don't believe there's ever been a leak from that roof, and it's well over 30 years. And it is much lighter, and it will help preserve that old structure in the old building. And finally, I'd really like to see you look at raising the plinth of that pilaster. 
One of the things that bothers me about the front entrance is that there's a differential from the top of the decorative plinth to the line of the window and the door and the little side lights. And I think if you pick all of that up so that it's level, so it matches the header and it gives you a bit of a plinth, I think it will look really original. Losing that plinth is, to my mind, and I'm not a historical architect, I'm an institutional architect, but losing that plinth is really unconscionable. So I'd like to see you look at that, ask the committee back again about the proportions, but I think the best proportion is to just move that all up so everything aligns across the header of the door and the midpoint of the door and gives you a plinth. Because without a plinth, it's going to look like it was a botch. So thank you very much. I think Feingold Alexander's done a great job. And I appreciate the ability to talk about this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if there are any other members of the public who would like to make a comment, raise your hand at this time. And I'm not seeing uh, any. I, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Tony, can you share the screen again just to show that front entry? Just so I'd like to see what Marty, I'd just like to see that, what she was talking about. Tony. And, uh, uh, Marty, I, I think you're right because we that did cross our minds and we can look at that. The, one of the things that we will definitely look at that because we're on the same page as you. Um, so see the side lights yeah. are are there. I think if you move that where your cursor is, if you move that up so it lines up with the side light of the door, it'll give you enough of a plinth to give you a base. I think it'll look awful if we shorten that plinth. And I think it'll actually make it more sense because if you look across the header of the door, it matches the bottom of the column cap. So yes. if you look at that, I think you can line it up mm -hmm. and give it and and then those side panels will have a base because without a base, it's going to look awful. It's going to look like, yeah, we raised it and it didn't work well. I think it's a really astute yep. observation. And I think there's many things that you say make a lot of sense. And I think that adjustment and sensitivity to reconstituting the pilaster and rebuilding a base back will make it feel as if it was always there. Yeah, I think it will. Yeah, I think it's a yeah. I think it's a really good observation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Nate, I'm not seeing any more hands raised for public comment. So I think at the, our last juncture, you were suggesting a motion from the commission. Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, there has been a few things mentioned that could come back. And so, you know, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how the commission feels. So, you know, there was the Whipple window. Um, if we needed, you know, the slate, if a, you know, if we wanted to go see any examples of slate roofs, um, there's some submittals in terms of maybe the windows or certain things, uh, the book drop, if there was some final, um, you know, discussion about color or materiality, I think the, I agree that darker will recede, right? So, um, you know, sometimes they're nice and shiny steel and it's like, okay, there it is. Or it could be something reminiscent of the plaque. Um, I think the front entry comment was really great. Um, I mean, I, I kind of agree with Jane with the roof monitor and some other things. I don't I don't think it's gonna be that visible when you're actually on the street. It's just an elevation. It, it looks like, you know, it's a six foot tall um, protrusion. And so I'm not, I'm, you know, I, I think that'll be okay. Um, we are seeing more of that in town, right? Where people put things on the roof, they don't have much of a parapet. And then really you can see 
all the mechanical equipment. It's really just actually like another story on a building. And so, you know, staff's getting more aware of that and how, how to treat that and whether that's, you know, um, with different design. Um, I don't, you know, from everything else, I don't have many other follow-up um, things. I think it was just those that I mentioned, unless there's others that the commission would want to see. And so I don't, you know, to me, that's, you know, is that, you know, do we want them to come back? Are we okay closing this and saying we, we've heard enough or are, are we expecting something radically different with one of those things that we'd want to wait? Um, um, and is this, is this our final meeting or do we have a meeting to address the changes to the interior? So there was some historic fabric in the interior that I know when we walked through, we had concerns about. Yeah, so this is really just with the preservation restriction. So it's only oh, the right. exterior, you know, in the site, it doesn't really yeah, go right. into the yeah. interior. So, yeah. you know, I think with the preservation restriction, they give examples of what's considered major or minor alterations. And so, you know, from the site, it's removal of mature trees and landscape features, which I think has been done really thoughtfully. Um, you know, there's a few mature trees. Uh, there's changes, obviously, to the site. And then, you know, in terms of the existing building, we're looking at, you know, the slate, the windows, um, and then with the, the addition is, you know, altogether new, and then there's new mechanicals and other things. And so, um, you know, it's not, it's not a straight, you know, preservation project. And I think Robin, you know, we had discussed that. And so I think that the, you know, interior standards allow for this, you know, um, so unless there's like certain, you know, things that the commissioner really would like to see back, you know, it's really just the exterior and the site. Um, so yeah, definitely within regard to the preservation restriction, that's our, um, our duty. I was thinking of the interior more as just an advisory conversation, um, and having those two things be separate. So focusing on the preservation restriction now, um, I'm just not sure how we would structure a motion. I'm happy to put one. I'm happy to so move one. <laughs> um, do you want to just give us the language maybe? Nate? I mean, you know, I would just say something that it's consistent with the restriction and the, and, you know, the standards, you know, national park standards, or, you know, it's, it doesn't, I don't think it's, um, has to be too, too okay. detailed. It's, it's really, you know, it's something that we, you know, we'll create a, a memo, kind of a summary memo of the two hearings, and it'll just go on file so that if, you know, we did this before for the Memorial Gardens in the, in the rear, and it's just something that we keep and it could be also, you know, made available to the public in the library. It's just something that we can track when the restriction has been reviewed. And so it's not, you know, it's not like we're making findings per se, like we are with the demolition review. Right. Um, so I would make a motion that, um, that the material, um, um, again, I'm not quite sure of the language material presented today or that the, the historical commission finds the plan consistent with um, the secretary of the interior standards for rehabilitation and approves the plans as discussed with the caveats that uh, around the windows and the Whipple window the exterior windows and the Whipple window. And was there a third item? The book book drop. Drop. Yeah. In the front entry door, just that the change in. Oh right. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient for a motion? <laughs> I think it works. Okay. So I need a second. I'll second the motion. Thanks, Michaela. Um. And then we need to offer the opportunity for any further discussion before we go to a vote with commissioners. Does anyone have any further comments? Okay, seeing and hearing none, um, I'll go with the roll call vote uh, for the motion before us. Um, I'll start with Hetty. Aye. Uh, Antonia. Aye. Michaela. Aye. Pat. Aye. And I will vote aye as well. So motion passes. We are six tonight, six to zero. No, five to zero.
And do we also need a motion to close the hearing, Nate? Yeah, I guess we could do that too. Okay, so uh, I move that we close this hearing uh, regarding the preservation restriction in the Jones Library. Second. Um, and uh, any further discussion? No, I wouldn't really have a further discussion there. Um, let's do a roll call vote. Uh, I'll start with Michaela. Hi. Uh, Pat. Hi. Antonia. Hi. Betty. Hi. And myself, I vote aye. So that closes this hearing. Um, I think we'd say, say a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. Um, that really, um, really great discussion and, and thorough and sensitive and we so much appreciate all your input. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Great thoughtful comments, very much appreciated. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for your time. Well. There's one of our couple of our commissioners. <laughs> so, um, I was, you know, we did have the a, a public meeting after this, just a one, you know, just to have a quick discussion. I know, did we lose uh, Pat and? Michaela, Michaela, did they yeah. the end of the meeting? So now we're below quorum. Yeah, so we could just adjourn. I, you know, my, my only thought was just to talk about the research for 4555 South Pleasant. It looks like Hetty's already doing that. So, you know, we have a little bit of time. I just wanted to just yeah. kind of keep that on the radar, not like, you know, I haven't done anything else either. Just I wanted to make sure that we we keep on that. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I know Tom Reed usually follows up um, and we ask for a few things. So. That's all. I just want. I just want to make you know make sure that it doesn't fall off the radar. Okay. Yeah. So technically, we're adjourned right now. Um, the other thing I was just going to ask Nate is if uh, what the appropriate follow up would be to ask their company about um, their experience with pursuing um, uh, tax credits and other um, other funding sources, um, just so that we have or case around whether or not um, a rehab of, of a building is uh, that, you know, that the people come before us and say it's not feasible. And usually what they mean is it's just not feasible financially and you know, pieces out there. And I don't quite know how to ask them, but. Um, you, mean, you, mean the library, you mean the library project? No, I don't mean the library project. You mean um, the South Pleasant Street, but just in general too, as we go forward and you know, for, for buildings that look like they could be rehabbed as opposed to demolished, um, a lot of times the answer we get is it's not feasible, but that usually means it's not, it's not that it's not physically feasible, it's not financially feasible. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm assuming through the discussion with the demolition hearing now, and I already asked Tom previously before that we'd have a structural engineer's report on the building, interior photographs and other things. And so I'm assuming we'll get that. Yeah, I mean, I think the building actually almost to their um, to their detriment, right? It's been maintained from the exterior, so it looks pretty good. Um, mm -hmm. But I'd love to know, right? How structurally sound is it? <clears throat> All those things. I know there's floor elevate. There's differences in floor elevations on the interior, and so even trying to get people inside is um, you almost can if you make improvements to it. So it almost has to stay unimproved because to meet you know new code accessibility codes. Right. Um, it, it's almost impossible. I know that the building commissioner has looked at it actually. He said it's really, really difficult to make that building work. If, you know, with any investment, you're going to trigger uh, A, A, B, you might have to get seek waivers for a lot. So, you know, those are the things that um, I, I feel like it was communicated during the hearing, and I can always follow up with Tom. So, Robin, if you want to, you know, I think you sent me an email, but if you have another one, I'll follow up with um, Tom and Barry on that. Okay. And, and Nate, had, thank you for doing it. Yeah, sorry. I was going to say, thanks for doing the research. And if you need any help, let me know. You know, I was looking at old Sanborn maps the other day, just trying to see if there's any notations or anything, but there really isn't. Um, I was looking through old photographs too, and I was just trying to find something, but I, you know, um, I didn't. So I. Well, I'm satisfied now that I've found a good document right. um, in the town history about the space being there. Um, even if it isn't appearing on the Sanborn maps and 
I'm coupling that with two other kinds of evidence. So essentially I've got three different kinds of evidence now to suggest the concert hall space in that back L. Um, and I, when I did a walkthrough, I didn't really feel like there were lots of really big changes in level, but um, I think that speaks to Robin's point about tax credits that where you have a building that is historically significant for the town um, in that location, it's possible that there could be money there for the developer and the owner to to work with. Um, From a commission standpoint, is that um, is it's that you know it sounds almost like the um, did you say the building commissioner? Is that making the title right, Nate? Yeah. yeah. But you know, having somebody when we're having these discussions for demolition delay, having somebody like that to come in and explain to us who's not the developer, you know, to explain to us the, the difficulty, because I think we know anytime someone's supposed for demolition delay, they just say like, you know, it can't be done, <laughs> you know, it's, it's falling apart. It's, you know, I mean, that's the standard answer. And, you know, sometimes, you know, you can trust that answer a little bit more, but for us as lay people, to have a somewhat disinvested party, to be able to come in and say, well, here's why it's financially not feasible. I mean, I think that's what we need to hear is like, what does financially not feasible mean? Because pretty much if you have enough money, you can do anything, <laughs> but you know, can you do it within the scope of what's realistic for our town and for that building? And, and I, I would feel better when we have those um, types of hearings to just, you know, to have it on the public record where, you know, if somebody's looking at these a much more thorough explanation. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think you can give us good input too, but really it's that, you know, that other person who's understands buildings to say, you know, you'd be looking at, and, and I, I mean, it also now I, I, I I think people take advantage of grant funding and I also know how hard it is, you know, that you really need to, work with a consulting company to, you know, the tax credit process is exhaustive and you have to be a different kind of developer. But I feel like if we don't ask those questions, publicly, we're not getting the fullest answer for the public record. And yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, yeah. I mean, I'm hoping during the delay, we can get some of these answers and a bit more information. Um, and it's, yeah, I think for the future, we could always, you know, continue a hearing if we wanted to get that, or, um, you know, we could, I mean, we just changed the bylaw, but, you know, we, it's hard to require certain things, but it'd be interesting if we are seeing more of this, you know, do we change the bylaw and say that there's certain pieces that are required of an application? So is it an engineer's report or something more than just, uh, you know, the word of the applicant? And so, you know, it, it's, we could, we probably have to app, you know have a waiver provision, but you know like you know when you apply to the planning board, we require a survey, stormwater management report prepared by right, you know right. an engineer and you know, all these things. And so, uh, you know, I think right what we're seeing with demolition is people are looking at maybe buildings they hadn't in the past because of the way the market, the housing market or real estate's working today. And so, um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. I was I was you know I. I often feel like we ask for things that is optional for an applicant, but maybe we need to, you know, we can put it in the rules and regs. And so that doesn't change the bylaw, but we could make it an application requirement through our rules and regulations. And uh, that might yeah, be I mean, I don't want to make it, I don't want to make it onerous. Um, you know, I don't mind asking, it, you know, but it's sort of like, you know, if somebody from the public is sitting and and watching the hearing and following, um, you know, or you know, if I talk to somebody on the street about it, you know, I can say, well, you know, these are the things that requested. Um, we had good input from the building commissioner that you know wasn't really a feasible rehab project from a financial standpoint. I mean, I think that that's you know even in the you know in the secretary's standards. You know, it, there's a little thing that says I was just looking at it where it says you know economic viability is, you know, vi and viability is different from we can't do it. So I'm fine with somebody saying we can't afford to do it, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, and then, you know, have, yeah, something to back that up. Right. Well, I think like A15, A15 Main Street, you know, the one down 
um, you know, almost to Pelham Road, right? It's the house right on the road that we allowed to be demolished, but the owner had been working on it for like two years. Yeah, yeah, he, right. So they had photographs. He had, um, yeah. you know, one or two reports from right. contractors. Yes. And, it was, and then the neighbors even said, you know, we saw him working on it for yeah. two years and it just wasn't really possible, right? You know, he showed us the damage, the, you know, he right. stripped it down to everything and it just, he couldn't make it work. And so, you know, to me, it felt like, okay, wow, even that, you know, you'd like to see something be saved, but I feel like the they had actually made an effort. Oh, and I think being able to go into that building in the basement, I mean, even as a lay person, once we got into the base, uh, you know, it's, there's 17 different support structural systems that aren't really working in tandem. And, you know, so that was, that was useful. Um, so, yeah. Okay. Well, those are just my thoughts recently. I mean, I guess like are the buildings here that we'd really like to see somebody try to, you know, put those financial packages together, like they're doing in other parts of the state or, you know, it's in East Hampton where they're turning the, you know, shells of mills into condos and you know is that realistic for us or not but um you know just to have a kind of a, a more clear picture mm -hmm. um be more comfortable with okay right. thanks mom guys Good meeting. We didn't, yeah, we didn't uh, schedule our meeting, but um, I, I'm happy to send out an email after this. I mean, I did have, we know that Madeline's not going to be joining us in January. Um, and we had a quorum. I can't remember. I think that Kayla I didn't get an answer from, but I'll just um, flip her. But yeah. I would also, um, that's that was a Monday. So that's the 13th of, of November. And um love to try to schedule our meetings on Mondays. I don't know if those are good days for you, Nate, but my feeling is that um, as the chair, uh, having a slightly different level of responsibility with all the information that comes in, I'm been, uh, working in Boston on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and trying to pull everything together for a Thursday and stuff that trickles in through the week. Um, before 6 30 meeting is really challenging and i'd love to have a meeting because that would leave me like you know kind of the weekend to get most of it organized and be more prepared um so i don't what is your general meeting schedule for mondays is that, so that, that works for, for me you? that works for me i mean we can okay. pull the commissioners but no it works for me i you know i have usually um three wednesdays a month and then two thursdays um so okay. mondays are good usually i'm usually i miss the housing trust or some other meeting for this, this, uh, for the commission. So, you know, it just means right. I get, I'm still going to go to a meeting. <laughs> it's just. Right, right, right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, yeah, I'll send that uh, out and we'll put it on the calendar for the 13th. Sure. Yeah. All right. That's it. Thanks Jim. guys. Thanks. Bye. Everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.